light, bursting the bubble. Evergrande, symbol of China's property crisis, heads to liquidation. A Hong Kong judge made the call after a troubled developer repeatedly failed to come up with a plan to restructure its debt. America's war. US troops killed in the Middle East while nations cut UN Palestine agency funding and Iran distanced itself from a deadly attack on US troops in Jordan. Soup for Lisa. Once again, climate activists target the Mona Lisa, this time throwing soup at the million dollar painting. And a cup of tea. Does salt and tea go together? Well, stick around to find out. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening and warm thank you for making us a part of your evening. Is America starting off another war under the Biden administration? And why did Niger, along with three other countries, quit the Africa Union? All those stories are coming up shortly, but first we begin in China. Now, Evergrande Group, the world's most indebted property developer, has been ordered to liquidate by a Hong Kong court in a massive setback for China's ailing real estate sector that could ripple through the world's second largest economy. The wind-up order made by the city's high court today comes after the embattled Chinese real estate giant and its overseas creditors failed to reach an agreement on how to restructure the company's massive debt. Chinese property giant Evergrande has been told to liquidate in a move set to send ripples through financial markets. A Hong Kong court gave the order Monday morning. It comes after the world's most indebted developer was crushed by more than $300 billion in liabilities. The firm defaulted on its debts back in 2021, throwing the country's whole property market into turmoil. Now the liquidation order is likely to deepen the crisis in the sector and jolt China's fragile capital markets. Beijing was already grappling with an underperforming economy and stocks wallowing near five-year lows. Now any new hit to markets could undermine revival efforts and ramp up demands for more stimulus measures. Evergrande had been working on a $23 billion debt revamp plan with bondholders. But those efforts were scuppered last September when billionaire founder Hui Kaiyan was put under investigation for suspected crimes. A liquidation petition was first filed back in June 2022, but the proceedings were adjourned multiple times as Evergrande scrambled for a survival plan. At least three other developers have already been ordered to liquidate by Hong Kong courts. Now the number of injured continues to climb after militias killed three U.S. service members and injured dozens more in an overnight attack on a military base in northeast Jordan. By late yesterday, the number of injured had climbed to 34 service members. Now these include at least eight personnel whose injuries warranted an evacuation from Jordan to higher level care, though they were believed to be in a stable condition. Meanwhile, Iran today said that they have no connection over the attacks in Jordan and blamed it on the regional militias. Three U.S. soldiers were killed in Jordan when a drone packed with explosives struck a shelter where troops were sleeping. We lost three brave soldiers in an attack on our base. Yes. And, uh, I'm asking you to hold the silence for all three of the smallest soldiers. Jesus. President Biden blaming radical Iran-backed militant groups operating in the region. More than 30 U.S. troops were also wounded, according to two U.S. officials, including several who were medevaced out because of the severity of their injuries. A spokesperson for the Jordanian government denied the attack occurred on their soil, but U.S. officials insist it was in Jordan. This is the first time U.S. troops have been killed during the more than three months of assaults by Iranian-backed militia groups. Now more than 160 attacks against bases with Americans in Iraq and Syria since October 17th. And just one week ago, multiple U.S. troops were injured when a barrage of ballistic missiles hit Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin releasing a statement saying he is outraged and deeply saddened. 
The attack targeted a small outpost near the Syrian border known as Tower 22, according to U.S. officials. The troops there work with and advise the Jordanian military. But it also supports the U.S. garrison on the other side of the border in Syria, called Al Tanf. The troops there tasked with keeping ISIS in check. But the entire area has a much bigger mission. Situated along a highway that runs from Tehran to Baghdad and all the way to Damascus, the troops there are cutting off a land bridge for Iran to move weapons and fighters into Syria. Now, three African nations, Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, announced that they are leaving the economic community of West African states immediately over differences between the nations and the coalition. Now, all three countries which were founding members of the coalition in 1975 are currently led by militaries that seized power from civilian leaders. Three West African states led by their militaries, Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso, say they're immediately leaving the economic community of West African states, serving a blow on Sunday to a regional bloc that's been urging them to return to democratic rule. The decision to quit the group known as ECOWAS was announced in Niger on TV by its military spokesman. After 49 years, the valiant people of Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger regretfully and with great disappointment observed that the organization has drifted from the ideals of its founding fathers and the spirit of Pan-Africanism. They argue that ECOWAS, under foreign influence, betrayed its founding principles and became a threat to its member states and their populations which it was supposed to ensure the well-being of. It was a joint statement also broadcast in Mali and Burkina Faso. ECOWAS said on Sunday it had not yet been formally notified about the withdrawal and declined further comment. The bloc has previously said it does not recognize the junta-led governments of the three countries and would not tolerate coups. The exiting states are all ruled by military leaders who have seized power since 2020. Late last year, they formed their own union called the Alliance of Sahel States, or AES, from its French name. They've also cut military and other ties with former colonial master France and turned to Russia for security support. The three neighbors have argued they want to restore security before organizing elections as they struggle to contain insurgencies linked to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. In Sunday's statement, the military leaders criticized ECOWAS for failing to help their countries, quote, in their existential fight against terrorism and insecurity and accused it of being influenced by external powers. It's unclear for now how the exit will impact the 15-member regional bloc where goods and citizens move freely, but the move could further weaken ECOWAS, which has struggled to contain a democratic retreat in the region of West Africa. To the conflict in Gaza now, the United Nations Relief and Workers Agency fired several staffers accused of having been involved in the October 7th Hamas terrorist attack against Israel. Now, Israel hailed the decision of several countries, including the US, to suspend financing to the agency. Concerns are now being raised over how this will impact Palestinians in Gaza scrambling to find food due to the ongoing war. These men try to outrun the hunger stalking Gaza. On this day, bags of flour have arrived. We managed to get just one bag, said this man. Often, there is not enough to go around. Many go home empty-handed. We need to eat, shouted this man. Our children are dying of hunger. The suspension of funding could not have come at a worse time. Gaza is on the brink of famine. The aid cuts amount to 70% of the relief agency's annual budget, said Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Eshtia. This measure is extremely dangerous and it is our hope that it will be reversed. For the more than 2 million Palestinians in Gaza who depend on that aid, the cuts are potentially crippling. On top of the constant hunger, now they cut our aid, this woman said. What did we do wrong? It is a collective punishment, said the head of the relief agency, which employs around 13,000 staff members in Gaza. Already, 152 of them have been killed. After nearly four months of war, more than 80% of Gazans have had to flee the fighting, forced out of their homes, their misery compounded by rain and cold. 
The UN organization is often the only source of food and water for those trapped inside Gaza. Now even that meager lifeline could collapse. Well, there was a shooting in Brisbane. That story coming up right after this break. You're watching World News Tonight. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Now, two men are facing multiple charges, including attempted murder after allegedly firing shots in central Brisbane before fleeing and setting a car on fire in a dramatic scene captured by a Queensland police helicopter. Following that story for us tonight is other governor's Wishmi Gamage, who joins me via Zoom from Melbourne, Australia with the latest Wishmi. Yes, Mahesh. Two men have been charged with attempted murder after three people were injured in a shooting in Brisbane. Streets were locked down in the middle of the city last night as an alleged drive-by shooting causing panic and chaos. Police allege it was a targeted attack on a man and that the suspects and one of the victims knew each other. Innocent bystanders were caught in the crossfire before a dramatic chase. Three people were shot, including the alleged intended target, a man in his 30s who was hit in the chest and leg. Both arrested men were refused bail to front Brisbane Magistrate Court today. Mahesh? Absolutely. Uh, dramatic footage there. Wish me come again to the Renewal World News Special Correspondent reporting from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you. To Ukraine now, as the Republicans question as to what Ukraine was doing with billions of dollars of aid money, Ukraine's SBU or Security Services Bureau has arrested five people who allegedly tried to steal nearly $40 million that was supposed to be used to buy shells for the country's military in its war against Russia. Now, two of those officials are from the Ministry of Defense. Ukraine's security service said it uncovered a $40 million corruption scheme that siphoned money allocated to purchase desperately needed weapons in midst of Russia's invasion. The SBU intelligence agency said the probe had exposed former and current high-ranking officials at the Ministry of Defense and managers of an arms supplier. It said the embezzlement involved a contract for 100,000 mortar shells with weapons maker Lviv Arsenal in August 2022, just six months into the war. Payment was made in advance, with some of the funds transferred abroad, but no arms were ever provided. The statement said five individuals had been served notices of suspicion, the first stage in Ukrainian legal proceedings. One suspect, the statement said, was detained while trying to cross the Ukrainian border. The announcement came on Saturday and will have a huge resonance in a country that's dealing with exhaustion after Russia's invasion two years ago. It also speaks to endemic corruption as a major issue as Ukraine presses its bid to join the European Union and amid a push for new funding and equipment from Washington. Corruption within the military has been a particularly sensitive issue in Ukraine and a defense minister was dismissed last year over various corruption cases, though he was not alleged to have engaged personally in graft. Alexander Stubb of Finland's centre-right National Coalition Party has emerged the winner of the first round of the country's presidential election and will go ahead to head with uh, Pekka Havesto of the Liberal Green Party in a runoff in two weeks' time. Following that story for us tonight uh, is Abid Darana World News Special Correspondent Sahan Abe Gunwardana standing by in Helsinki with the latest. Sahan? Yes, Mahesh. All nine candidates are promising a tough stance towards Russia if elected president. A role that leads on foreign and security policy in close cooperation with the government and represent of country at NATO meetings, while also acting as a commander-in-chief of the Finnish Defence Forces. As polls closed, Justice Ministry data showed centre-right candidate Alexander Stubb of Finland's National Coalition Party led the first round with 28.3%. The Liberal Green Party member Pek Kahaviasto was second with 25.8% support, followed by the Nationalist Finns party Jussi Halla Aho at 16.1%. The data shows as 613 of all votes cast were counted. A second round runoff between the top two contenders will be held on February 11th if no candidate obtained more than 50% of the vote yesterday's election.
Mahesh. Absolutely. Well, uh, Sahana Begunwardana, Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent reporting from Helsinki in Flin Finland. Thank you. All right, now to the latest on the road to the White House. Donors of Nikki Haley are coming to the realization that apparently, perhaps, she has no part towards clinching the nomination for president from the Republican Party. This race is far from over. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley vowed to stay in the race this week after coming in second behind frontrunner Donald Trump in New Hampshire's primary contest. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. But that disappointing finish has proven a hard lesson for her deep-pocketed donors. It seems big money can't win the Republican presidential nomination. At least, not against Trump. And just a little note to Nikki. She's not going to win. She's not going to win. This analysis of campaign finance disclosures filed with the Federal Elections Commission, or FEC, shows groups backing Haley outspent the main outside groups supporting Trump by more than two to one over the past year. The primary pro-Haley super PAC has so far reported spending more than $70 million in that period. And another super PAC affiliated with conservative billionaire Charles Koch reported spending around $40 million, either supporting Haley or attacking Trump. That's compared with the $50 million reported spent by the main Trump-boosting super PAC called MAGA Inc. And Trump has enjoyed two comfortable primary wins, first in Iowa and then New Hampshire. She had a very bad night. She had a very bad night. The Trump and Haley campaigns did not respond to requests for comment. Haley is the last remaining challenger to Trump in the primary. Former rivals, including Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, have dropped out and endorsed the former president. One former candidate, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, seems to have understood that big dollars would make little dent in Trump's dominance. He was caught on a hot mic saying this about Haley's campaign spending. She spent 68 million so far, just on TV. Spent 68 million so far, 59 million by DeSantis, and we spent 12. I mean, who's punching above their weight and who's getting a return on their investment, you know? And she's gonna get smoked. And you and I both know it, she's not up to this. The apparent failure of anti-Trump Republicans to stop him highlights his popularity with his supporters. I really love the guy, and I've never felt that way about a politician before. Many of who dismiss the multiple criminal prosecutions he faces as politically motivated. Trump says he is innocent of all the charges. The disempowering of wealthy donors is yet another way that Trump, who is financially fueled by small contributions, has fundamentally remade the Republican Party. Well, what makes a good cup of tea? Stick around to find out. This is World News Tonight. Welcome back, everyone, to World News Tonight. Now, with online uh, buying health check tests on the internet rapidly growing, Experts are warning of potential bogus tests that provide no medical benefits to customers. Online shopping can be a minefield at the best of times, especially when it comes to your health. Buying direct-to-consumer tests, a growing market. A world-first study from the University of Wollongong identified almost 500 direct-to-consumer test products available, with prices ranging from $12.99 to almost $2,000. It found some commercial health checks had limited evidence behind them. Among them, tests to determine biological age, bone health, microbiome analysis and sleep quality. Some other tests, many not recognised by the medical community, include hair analysis for food allergies and tests for leaky gut syndrome and adrenal fatigue. The small percentage of online tests found to have potential clinical use include bowel cancer test kits, STI home tests and cardiovascular disease risk factor tests. Well, no smiles for the Mona Lisa tonight after two climate activists threw soup at 
the protective glass around the Mona Lisa at the Louvre Museum in France. The pair of protesters were shouting slogans in the museum advocating for a sustainable food system in France. She rests behind protective glass and for good reason. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa targeted by protesters. The duo hurling soup at the 16th century masterpiece and ducking under a security barrier. Their t-shirts bearing the words food response in French, a climate activist group. What's more important, they scream, art or right to healthy and sustainable food. Museum staff rushing partitions into place and moving visitors on. It comes amid an ongoing protest by farmers, who in recent weeks have been using tractors to block roads and slow traffic across the country. They're fighting for more money for their produce, as well as protection against cheap imports and a reduction in red tape. It's a very problematic situation. We want to change that, this food response activist says. It's not the first time the famous artwork has been attacked. In 2022, cake was smeared on its protective glass by a man disguised as an elderly woman in a wheelchair. No way! French police say two people were arrested over this latest incident. Now to the biggest question uh, you and I will get this week. What makes a good cup of tea? Well, a good brew, a bit of milk and of course sugar, but here in Sri Lanka, um, a nice piece of jaggery. But in the United States, scientists is inserting itself uh, into this conversation and now says, why not put a pinch of salt? Because that elevates a normal cup of tea, according to them. Trouble is brewing over the best brew. Well, the secret ingredient that set off all the um, furor was salt. The tussle over tea started when U.S. scientist Michelle Frankel made the salty suggestion. And that you could add a pinch of salt to remove some of the bitterness from tea. But it's leaving a bitter taste in Britain. Ew. <laughs> yeah, that just sounds weird. Rubbish. <laughs> Frankel's proper pot, outlined in her new book, is steeped in science. There's recent research that shows that the sodium ions, they block the bitter receptors, so you can sort of tell your tongue not to taste the bitter. The tempest in a teapot triggered a diplomatic dispute. The U.S. Embassy in London tweeted, the unthinkable notion of adding salt to Britain's national drink is not official U.S. policy. But cheekily added, Tea is made in a microwave, not a kettle, rubbing salt in an old wound. To show how to make a real cup of tea. You don't need a microwave to make a cup of tea. All you need is a naked flame, tea bag, sugar. Frankel knows the battle between tradition and science is causing quite a stir, but she's pouring it on. You know, if you want a taste of tea that's a little less bitter, try that pinch of salt. A storm in a teacup that'll keep boiling across the Atlantic. Well, it makes sense because, uh, you know, we put salt in order to elevate the taste of any dish we eat, uh, where we cook. So it, it does make sense, but maybe a little bit of salt, not a lot. Well, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition. Tonight. See you then. Bye.